Hi, all. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Welcome. John will be on shortly. He's with um, a couple of HBCU students right now. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Hi, how are you? Finding you. Good, good, <laughs> good. I'm so excited to see you all here today. Thank you. Glad to be here today. Hello, Mr. Gordon. You're on mute. <laughs> Our moderator's on mute. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Get off me. How Get are off you? Me, Tim. <laughs> John is over with the HBCU kids right now. He'll be over on time. Thank you, yeah. guys. Has everybody got a chance to watch the movie? Hi, Jamie. <laughs> I forgot to unmute. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> how are you? Good to see you. I'd have never seen you on here. You're always assigning someone. I know, I know. I'm in the background being the boss woman now. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you as well. So Tim, you're going to take it over when John comes in? Absolutely. That's the plan. Fabulous. <laughs> he said um, about the list, he was like, hey, I see a lot of my friends on here. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. That is a good thing. Awesome. Okay. I'm Tiaka, not Ross necessary. <laughs> okay. Nice meeting you. You too. I'm sorry, Jamie. You Hello. I just realized. Nice. I it's good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> no because this is lion's gates um they're little because i couldn't have john on both at the same time yeah <laughs> i don't think we've ever met so it's no exactly yeah. like, i was like wait a minute i'm tia yeah, because i'm like who is that uh, yeah i'm not rock <laughs> theory <laughs> never that's why i said i've never seen you on here before i know i know yeah i always have a freelancer doing the assignments right. you know? always you boss? that's right yeah it's like a million things to do running the site it's a lot of yeah. work so with me calling him please delegate. run this please <laughs> and i know it's a whole bunch of me <laughs> yes otherwise i don't know I, I would need to be cloned right. to do the amount of work that requires to run the site so yeah i appreciate you all okay cool let me check on john really quickly and i'll be right back Noah Bedroom. So now third down at 18. Bingo running for his luck.
Jamie. Mr. Tim Gordon. You can't work and, and be in this room at the same time. It, it, I was just told I can't watch a football game, so nobody's doing anything. <laughs> How you doing, Jamie? Work never stops. I'm doing good. It, it, it does not. And I appreciate you not sending an underling over today. No, listen, when you when I get a call from Mr. Tim Gordon himself, you know, I got to show up. You funny. <laughs> <laughs> you are funny. No, I saw you guys just, um, I think somebody on your team just interviewed John and uh, Leslie the other day. Yeah, Giandra. She mostly does a lot of our um, on-camera stuff. So yeah, you'll see her a lot on the junket circuit. Got it. That's uh, good to hear. So yeah, everything going yeah. well with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of coming down from my euphoria from yesterday because uh, we had a tweet that went viral and it got shared on the shade room. Nice. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like the shade room is like sharing our content. Cause like people Man. like, pay money. yeah, people like pay money to get their content put they on the do. shade room. Okay, I'm going to go like and retweet. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, our IG. Congratulations. Like, you know, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, it was a nice little glow up. Like, I think we got like 4,000 followers yesterday just from the, from them sharing our post. So it was, it was wild. Um, nice yeah yeah it's what have you been up to man hard work man we're in the middle of award season so festivals toronto getting ready for middleburg next week and you know we go there did you uh no no i did everything uh uh virtual this year so yeah same but but i am going to middleburg next week though so i'm gonna double mask and take some tests and do some stuff because we got to see these movies because I'd rather spread them out early than get yes. jammed in November with here's, here's 90 movies. Watch all these this month. <laughs> I, and that's going to be me because a lot of these virtual festivals aren't screening everything virtually. You got to be there physically. <laughs> yeah. and so I'm going to be one of those people just hanging out in the house, just watching movies all day. Um, okay. And my screeners. Yeah, well, you know, well, good luck. Stay safe. <laughs> look at sex, look at that sexy Tim. Man, look at see, I, I, I knew Sean was gonna put a jacket on, so I had to put one on. What's up, Sean? Sean? We have John enter hey, the room. I don't think I've ever seen Sean wearing like casual clothes. I have. Yes, oh, come on. Yes, you have. Yes, you I have. have. <laughs> I gotta spend more time around Sean. <laughs> yeah, That's I can get real cash. I can get real casual. <laughs> oh, feel your background, man. You got some artwork happening. All right, I see you. I see you, Mr. Edwards. <laughs> you are crazy, man. Oh, you got man. a piece from the Good morning, got a y'all. Piece from the Jazz Museum. I see Good what you do, Mr. Ridley. <laughs> How are y'all? Good. How are you? I'm, I'm blessed despite myself. Oh, do you guys hear any feedback on my end? No. Take it away. Little, a little something on somebody, but it's all. Oh, there you go. I didn't even know John was in here. John, you were hiding, man. I didn't see you. Undercover oh. brother. That didn't come from nowhere. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So we ready to get started? Yeah, let's do it. All righty. Well, I'm going to do my three-minute kind of intro for uh, Mr. Ridley, if y'all guys will indulge me. Um, so here we are. Good afternoon and welcome to our initial Real Contender series with Oscar winning screenwriter and two time Black Real Award winner John Ridley for its upcoming film, Needle in the Time Stack. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm Tim Gordon, founder and CEO of the Black Real Awards. And Mr. Ridley, we are honored that you're joining us today. Now, we would like to thank Lionsgate Film as well as members of the Black Real Award Voting Academy. This afternoon's event is also an official celebration of Black Cinema event, and we also want to welcome members of the Critics' Choice Association, as well as our at-large guests that are participating in today's roundtable discussions with Mr. Ridley. Now, before we begin, and for the uninitiated, Mr. Ridley is a screenwriter, television director, novelist, and showrunner. His initial foray into the entertainment industry was as a stand-up comedian, which always makes me laugh. And he had the distinction of appearing on Late Night with David Letterman and The Tonight Show with Johnny, starring Johnny Carson. He later began writing for sitcoms, including Martin and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air back in the 1990s. 
After both writing and directing his feature debut, the 1997 crime thriller, Cold Around the Heart, he and Oliver Stone co-adapted Ridley's first novel, Stray Dogs, into the 1997 Stone-directed film, U-Turn, which was released slightly earlier than Cold Around the Heart. Now a prolific writer, Ridley's novel, Spoils of War, was adapted into the 1999 David O. Russell-directed Three Kings. In addition, he's also wrote several other well-received novels, including Love is a Racket, Everybody Smokes in Hell, The Drift, Those Who Walk in Darkness, my personal favorite, A Conversation with the Man, and the graphic novel, The American Way. Now, from 2000 to 2010, Mr. Ridley was a commentator and blogger for NPR, whose blog, Visible Man, a play on Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, served as his platform. As a screenwriter, Mr. Ridley has received critical acclaim for his work on screenplays, including the Academy Award and Black Reel Award for 12 Years a Slave, making him just the second African-American to win the award, joining Jeffrey S. Fletcher, who did Precious. Um, never one to shy away from provocative subject matter, Mr. Ridley was the creator and showrunner of the anthology series, American Crime, as well as a six part British drama serial, Gorilla, which was set in the early 1970s London. Um, he's also directed the documentary, Let It Fall, Los Angeles, 1982 to 1992. He also co-founded back in 2018, No Studios, a creative arts hub in his native city of Milwaukee. Ridley stated that the space was his desire to create a collaborative workspace and social community that offers an environment for artists and art lovers to come together. An avid comic book fan since the 1970s, Mr. Ridley has also been working on Future State, the next Batman, proving that representation is necessary and essential as we continue to evolve as a society. His latest project, which we're here to discuss today, is based on the 1966 short story from sci-fi writer Robert Silverberg, Needle in a Time Stack. Mr. Ridley's adaptation ruminates on love, relationships, serendipity, all within the futuristic examination of evolving or alternate timelines. The film features an amazing and talented cast, which includes Cynthia Erivo, Leslie Odom Jr., Frida Pinto, and Orlando Bloom. Writer, director, novelist, showrunner, activist, visionary, John Ridley is truly a real contender, and we are honored that he is here with us today. Mr. Ridley, welcome. <laughs> How is that? I, I, I don't know what to say. I, I'm, I'm going to invite you to my, my wake because you need to read that over my body. That, that, was, that was very special. Yeah, well, you know, Thank you. Pretty. You, you are absolutely pretty special. So I wanted to begin before we start uh, talking to your film. Um, I've never been to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but from what I've read and understood, uh, it, is, it is a very bustling, active area full of a lot of African-Americans, a lot of folks who have deep roots. Um, how did growing up in that area of the country, in Milwaukee, how did that kind of form who you became as a writer, as an artist, et cetera? Uh, that's a very good question. Let me start, first of all, by saying it's, um, it's very much an honor to be speaking with you all this morning. I appreciate you taking the time and having the interest. Um, and I appreciate what you do, you know, recognizing talented artists and storytellers who happen to be people of color um, and have been doing this for quite some time is really extraordinary. Um, I've been out in Hollywood for many, many years. And as I've said many times, while the circumstances are better for creators of color, um, they're not great and they're barely good. So to have advocates, to have people who recognize, to have people who hold up the things that we, we do um, means the world. So thank you, it would deeply appreciate it. On behalf of all of us who are just trying to tell stories, thank you. Um, growing up in Milwaukee, uh, it was, uh, it's complicated. It becomes complicated even more so with distance. Um, I have an amazing family. I had two parents who just, um, uh, you know, service was what they were all about and community was what they were all about and, um, never, uh, giving in to any obstacle that might be in one's path. 
you know, that they, they taught us, myself, my sisters, that, um, you know, struggle is part of life and you can acknowledge it and you can rail against it. But once you've done that, you also got to keep moving forward. And all the things that I, I have, um, it's because of my parents, it's because of my grandparents, it's because of everybody who came before me who refused to give in to the circumstances that the prevailing culture put upon people of color historically and, and still do. Um, I love Milwaukee, I love Wisconsin because of the Midwestern values, because people here tend to be very humble, um, because they tend to just go out and work and do work because they, they care, they care about people and they care about community. Um, at the same time, Milwaukee is, although it's a great city, um, by real true metrics, not just by feelings and emotion, this is one of the most segregated cities in America. And it was a kind of segregation. It may not have been as loud as in other parts of the country. It may not have been as demonstrative as how we may think of it in particular geographies, but one of the most segregated cities in America to this day is not some small town in the South, um, not some uh, uh, region that has historical hard racism that we may you know, think of when we think of a Birmingham, when we think of a Selma, but it's in a, a decent sized city in, in the Midwest. And as I moved to other places, you know, that's one of the things I started to really recognize and realize, not just in Milwaukee, but real hard racism you know when i when i moved to new york it was you know bernie's gets and howard beach and uh you know the police department that had no problem firing you know 40 bullets at a black man who's just trying to get into his doorway and you realize that you know a lot of times that we're as we as people like me get our education about civil rights oh well it largely happened here it was largely there but it it those struggles presented themselves in, in many different ways in many different spaces. And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to come back to Milwaukee and, and create a space where it was about bringing artists and storytellers and people who push society together of all different kinds of backgrounds and saying that we got to tell stories. I mean, think about how many times, um, even though, as I've said, you know, there, there aren't enough storytellers who represent different demographics and different spaces in Hollywood. How many stories that we've seen where you saw a black man as a president, you, you saw um, uh, stories of people overcoming, you saw stories that even they may have been slightly inarticulate or still were told with a, the gaze of the prevailing culture. I think Glory is a great movie. It's a phenomenal movie. You know, it's told from Matthew Broderick's point of view. But it was still a story that began to educate the prevailing culture on, you know, we, we fought, we died. This is our country too. This is, you know, when people talk about we want our country back. Well, it's not yours. So there's no giving it back. So to me, to bring storytellers together, particularly storytellers of color, but of all backgrounds and saying, we got to go out there and tell these stories. And I still need education on stories that are outside of my lived experience. That was very, very important to me. So Milwaukee, you know, the reason I'm here is because of Milwaukee, certainly because of my parents, certainly because of their struggles, the things that I learned that the ways that this community supported me, but also the ways that I realized that this community maybe has not historically supported everyone the way they should. And knowing that if I have an opportunity, I have to make the most of it, but then I also have an obligation to come back and make sure that I'm helping create opportunities for everyone so that everyone then has the opportunity to tell stories, to educate, to engage, and sometimes just entertain. Sometimes that's all you gotta do is just entertain. That's okay too. Now, we have a lot of critics and uh, journalists that are on this call uh, in this round table today. And one of the things that to a person we always hear is we talk to our audiences and they'll tell us a lot of times that they're tired of, you know, quote unquote, slave narratives or Jim Crow stories and things of this nature. And I assert that since our history in this country as a, as a taken or stolen people brought here, it makes any story that's for the most part historical, there's gonna always be a challenge and an overview of race. Um, as a, as a, an African-American artist, how challenging is it to you to create work 
within the prism of those sorts of, of stories, like Needle in the Time Stack is a wonderful example that's not about race. It's a, a story, a, a kind of a, a sci-fi story, but how challenging is it for you when you're creating films? And I've seen your body of work, the, the Let It Fall, uh, you know, you, you look at gorillas, some of the other things that you've done that have, have been, but how challenging is that for you as an artist? That's a very, very good question. And, and it's really a multi-part answer. So I'll try to, if you don't mind, I'll try to answer um, a couple of, or, or, or provide some perspective on a couple of points. And, and I'll try not to take too long in doing it. You know, you talk about how hard it is or how hard it may be for, for me as a storyteller but also I think we have to look at sort of the, the, the cyclical nature of storytelling. So, you know, it used to be back in the day, um, just telling any stories about the, the black American experience and those struggles and, and what we have historically had to go through. And certainly things like my father, my grandfather, what they've had to go through, you know, getting those stories told at all was a challenge, you know. Um, Every once in a while, there were the socially, con you know, I'm talking about in the 40s and the 50s in Hollywood, you have a couple of socially conscious stories about blackness. As you got to the 60s, you had a few more. You had these amazing stories with Sidney Poitier, like The Heat of the Night or Lilies of the Field. Lilies of the Field, not so much about race in and of itself, but certainly seeing black people as contributing or, or being part of the narrative in any way, shape or form. Guess who's coming to dinner, things like that. But they were very, you know, specialized films. Sidney Poitier, amazing actor, but someone who was, you know, okay, he's, you can tell a story of struggle, but he's palatable. And I don't mean this as an indictment of Mr. Poitier at all, but just as an audience receives him, okay, that's a black man we can, we can deal with telling a story of struggle. Great stories, great movies, but they were kind of one-offs. Start moving into the 70s, that started to change, became what people call black exploitation films. Some of them were great, you know, films like Sounder. If you haven't seen Sounder recently, if you haven't seen it at all, please watch that film because that's just great filmmaking. And it may get dumped in a bucket of, oh, this is black exploitation, but that is just a great film, period. End of discussion. Shot amazingly, Leon Elder, third playwright writing it, obviously the amazing Cicely Tyson, Paul Winfield, great film. Um, then you start to move in the 80s, really tough. You know, society was changing, Reaganism, uh, didn't want to hear about stories about people of color, did things like soldier story, things like that. So, so it wasn't, so to begin with, it wasn't even like, oh, we're telling a lot of stories about our struggle. It was occasionally got an opportunity to even acknowledge in a wider venue that we've struggled at all, right? Then we get into a time period, you know, where Hollywood starts to recognize that there's a little bit of bank in telling stories like Glory, like Driving Miss Daisy, like um, uh, Boys in the Hood, uh, like eventually 12 Years a Slave. So they wanted to tell stories, but they became just about stories of struggle. And that's certainly, to your point, a, a big part of, of our history. But then Hollywood, you know, now all I get is people sending me stories about the, the most challenging, difficult aspects of Black American history. And I'm not gonna say that those moments didn't happen, but there's so much more to our story and so much more to who we are as people. So where it becomes difficult is that sometimes the prevailing culture, and when I say prevailing culture, I just mean white people in power, you know, in any industry, they go, okay, well, that, that's where the money is. That's where the stories are. That's where the big awards are. So let's tell more stories like that. And again, I don't want to say that those are not true stories or there's not value in them, but when that just becomes all they want to see from us or hear about us, that's where it becomes problematic. And so to be able to move into spaces where um, it's, you know, it, it, it is a story like Needle in a Time Stack, where to me, everything that you graciously said about the film, that's just beautiful. It's about love. It's about relationships. You know, that's, to me, that's what I appreciate about a story like this because it's us front and center, but it's just us as people. And I think the more that we can tell stories like that, there, there just needs to be balance in the kinds of stories. So I, I love seeing these moments where we're all educated about those who came before, who made our lives, our opportunities, our existence, 
a little better, you know, stroke for equality, but that's not it. And if that's all the stories that they want from us, then it becomes a disservice because that becomes the narrative of blackness, of what they expect from us, of what they see in us. Oh, okay, it's great. We acknowledge your struggle. That's great that you do acknowledge that, but are you acknowledging all the things that we can do, all the stories that we want to tell, um, and all the opportunities that everybody should have to tell whatever stories are close to their heart? Now, for Needle in the Time Stack, I remember, but even before I saw the film, I read the synopsis, and as a huge fan of the Twilight Zone, that's what initially my, my, I was in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this is Twilight Zone-ish. When I watched the film and kind of saw what you created from uh, Mrs. Silverberg's uh, short story, um, I enjoyed it a lot. I love different layers to the story. Um, us thinking through along with Leslie Odom's character about how every time one of these uh, is it called a time wave? I'm not sure exactly what yeah, it's called. Basically, yeah, time shift. Yeah, yep. So every time one of these comes along, how you have to go back and reconnect with whoever's close to you in your life to make sure that everything is still as it was. Um, what what fascinated you about that? Because I know from, from reading through your, uh, your bio and, and looking at your body of work, I'm not going to say this is a departure from you because I've read <laughs> some of your books. Um, but this sci-fi element that you, you, you are attracted to, what was it that spoke to you about this story? Honestly, everything that you said, you know, the what if, just as a person, we walk through life, you know, what if I'd done this? What if I'd done that? What if I'd stayed with that partner instead of going with this person? You know, what, what if I'd gone to college here instead of there? Um, and would our lives be crazy different? Would they be better? Would they be worse? Would they be a version of the same? Um, that really attracted me just as a person um, to be able to show relationships and complicated relationships. And I don't mean complicated in a hyper dramatic way, but just complicated as, as people, you know, relationships are complicated, relationships take work. Um, you may be mad, crazy in love with somebody. It doesn't mean you don't have arguments. It doesn't mean you have days where you're just like, ah, not, not today. I can't. Um, but that's what relationships are all about. So uh, and certainly working with that cast. I mean, every one of the, you know, there's a story with every one of those actors, how, how I came to work with them and really enjoyed them, really enjoyed the process, really enjoyed what they brought to it, not just as hyper-talented actors, but just as people. Um, enjoyed the making of it, enjoyed the pursuit of just what's the most beautiful frame? What's the most beautiful moment? What's the most interesting shot that we can come up with? Um, and, and a liberation, honestly, from, from thinking about, you know, 12 years of slave, you read Solomon's narrative and you feel like, I, I, I got to get this right. There's, there's no room for error in, in telling Solomon's story. There's, there's no room for error. And everybody involved in that, in, in telling 12 years felt that way. And, and I think we as a unit accomplished everything that we set out to accomplish, but there's a burden with that. And with Needle, it was liberating. It was like, I don't, I don't, not thinking about the audience. I'm not thinking about history. I'm not thinking about legacy. I'm just thinking about, okay, here we are today. What, what are we gonna do that's beautiful, interesting, challenging, emotional? How are we gonna connect with an audience? How are we gonna go after an audience that's select? You know, this to us was like, this is a select story for select people. And that is, you know, liberating in many ways not uh it's just we gotta do this for everybody it's got to play in every corner of the world you know that, that there's nothing wrong with that having big budget movies that play in america they play in canada play in china play in nigeria play wherever but something nice about now nah, we're making this for our friends we're making it for like-minded people it, it was just a wonderful experience and so thankful to lionsgate um you know, you would think after the career that I have, the career that Leslie's having and Cynthia, that we could make a movie and, you know, people would be like, oh, but that's a no brainer. We got to do it. It's always a challenge. There's always some kind of a challenge, but to have partners like uh, Lionsgate, who essentially just said, you know, make the movie you want to make, we will support you. We will get it out there, not just streaming, but a theatrical release. Um, they've been absolutely amazing. And uh, 
to start this film before not just the pandemic, but the, the year of, of all of us dealing with race, dealing with reckoning, dealing with understanding, um, and, and getting to a place where only the most hard-hearted can deny that there are is a huge segment of the population that still does not see us as people. You know, to start that film before that, and then subsequent to that, when this film is coming out, not only for Lionsgate to say the film has value and we want to put it in a theater as people are coming back into theaters, but for them to say it's, it's more important than ever for people to see people of color as people who laugh, who love, who live. Um, I cannot say enough about Lionsgate supporting this film um, and what it means to me, uh, would, would mean to me at any time in my career, but means a little bit more at this point in my career, honestly. Now, we've got a lot of creative people on the line, John, and um, I, I, I've got a, a, another good friend of mine who's actually here, at the, uh, Richard Wesley, who wrote Uptown Saturday Night and Let's Do It Again. So I love talking to writers about process and not just the films that you've made, but you know, you heard me say in my intro earlier that I, I, I remember reading Conversation with the Man, and I'm like, he's got to adapt that and make that into a film, uh, a Sammy Davis Jr.-esque sort of a story. Yeah. Um, talk to me about your process. And so I, I think about a movie that the one we're talking about today, Needle in the Time Stack, which is a short story. A lot of this is through your imagination of your interpreting his, his material and then bringing it to us. What Explain to us or go a little bit into your process of the creation of these stories. Well, first of all, let me say, um, Uptown Saturday Night, let's do it again. I, I can remember my dad taking me to see those movies in the movie theater. And I remember just that feeling of, you know, growing up on Disney films and things like that. And those are all fine, but, but going to a movie theater and seeing us and, you know, laughing and, you know, it was, the movies were funny and they were, you know, little bits of thriller and, um, you know, this kind of just great comedy. I, I just, you know, that those kinds of movies were the kinds of movies, that, it's the reason I'm sitting here today and everything about it, having an afternoon with my dad, going to the movie theater, oh, it's special. You know, my dad, black man of a certain age, so boy, I'm not spending money on any movie. I didn't take you to the movie theater. Go, oh, wait, wait, Uptown Saturday night. All right, get in the car, we're going. Um, everything about that was special. So it, 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 it's, it's special to feel like you're part of a continuation of entertainment, of storytelling, of, um, you know, being able to, to just acknowledge people that inspired you. They had no idea that they were inspiring you. So it, it, it makes this morning all the more special for me in terms of process. Um, Richard, sorry, yeah, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, in terms of process, for me as a writer, um, I have done a lot of adaptations and I really just try to insert myself as little as possible into the source material because if I'm reading something that I love, I, I, don't, I don't wanna mess with it if I don't have to. But when I do have to insert myself in the process, I try to execute at the highest level possible so that what I'm bringing to it, again, if I loved it, you know, there's, there's a feeling, oh, there's something great in there if I loved it. And so I got to try to match the greatness of somebody else, whoever that writer is, if it's Solomon Northup, if it's Robert Silverberg, um, they've inspired me. And I really appreciate inspiration. I appreciate that feeling of, you know, I watched that movie, I watched that movie, I watched that movie, but man, that movie, that book, that story, something that grabbed me. And so I appreciate what somebody sat down and did. So I don't want to change a lot. So my process historically, particularly with adaptation is if I read something, I got to love it. If I love it, I got to be honorific to it. And I can't come at it with a little bit of arrogance of, yeah, that was good, but I'm going to, I'm going to show the writer what they really meant. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put some John Ridley magic on it. No, it, it, this was great. Let me honor that greatness in my adaptation and whatever work I do on that story. All right, so uh, I'm, we've got a bunch of really talented people in the room and I wanna open up the floor for some questions. And I think, uh, first I wanna read some of the stuff that's in the chats, which I think are really funny. Um, Kevin Sampson from Picture Lock wrote, 
Uh, you know, you were giving a history lesson earlier about you talking about black film, and I'm looking at Sean Edwards, who has written uh, several. Is it Sean? Is it books about black film? Because I know I contributed to one. Uh, so you know, you're a historian online. I'm a historian online. Uh, John is a part of a legacy. Sean, do you have anything, man, about history? Since we're talking about John being a part of the continuing cycle of these artists who are contributing to the legacy of black film. So what were you asking me? <laughs> you know what, man? <laughs> I just said, do you have anything to add about him as a person who has written several books on this subject that we all love so much? No, this, he's great. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> I'm absorbed. I'm a sponge to this. It's not about me. I'm a sponge today. <laughs> I'm a sponge, man. I'm a, okay. I'm a, this, this is great. I'm a, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, let, me, let me continue being a sponge today. All right, well, that's good. Okay, sponge on, my brother. Uh, Kevin Sampson from Picture Lock Road as a film professor. I'm here for this history lesson. Preach, John Ridley. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think uh, Russell Williams, uh, two-time Oscar winner, is in the room, and you asked how, you can, how can you contribute? Do you have a question, sir, or a comment? Uh, I have, first of all, high praise that I'd like to offer to my Libra brother. Happy Thank belated you. birthday. Thank you, brother. Mine's coming up next Thursday. And um, a lot of the things that you've said, John, really, res I've, I've got 12 years on you. So <laughs> when you mentioned Poitier, uh, as I put in the chat, that was that Heat of the Night was a movie that actually mm. made the filmmaking as a career something that was tangible because before that it was, you know, as you had said earlier, it's entertainment. It offers you an opportunity to escape. It offers you an opportunity to vicariously live through other people's lives. So the 1959 Ben-Hur was a movie that really sealed music, cinema, great writing, great acting. Uh, you mentioned Glory, which I did the sound on, and that's a perfect example of how had someone like you been in the room in the development stages because the movie worked, but the movie could have right. worked a lot better because right. they also had the letters of the black soldiers yeah. because they, the movie gave the impression that only math, or rather that only Andre Brower's character was literate. Yeah. Okay. Whereas most of the 54th were literate. They were businessmen. They were freedmen. They decided, Hey, let me go down here and fight for my freedom. As, as you said, you know, they're not giving us anything. Yeah. Um, so had someone like you that looked like you been in the room and says, well, look, we could have parallel narratives going on. So Matthew's riding home talking about how he's not sure that his command is going to be effective with these black soldiers and the black soldiers letters could have said, hey, you know what? We're getting to know each other. But I, on, when the day comes, like I said, at the right. tree, we want to go down standing up. Right. Um, so. And, and I've also been a fan of science fiction and, and what I've, I haven't had a chance to see this film yet, but I've also heard that the film really is focused on the relationship aspect of it in the science fiction. We don't explain how you're able to no. go from this time period to the other, but that from the, from the book that you've adapted, that it really stays true to how the relationships unfold and do things get better or get worse. So, so for me, I've always been a fan of, of science fiction and my, my daughter's writing a science fiction film. How do you really look at something like this and, and, and just get to the center of it? Is it, is it just the characters or how much does the time? And, and if you can clue me in what time period does this take place or is that also not established in your film? Um, well, first of all, you know, thank you for your work in the industry. And again, it's so wonderful to be able to just um, speak with those who inspire us. And I absolutely agree with you about Glory, an amazing film, but it is, you know, Matthew Broadwick saying, hey, let me introduce you. I got, right. I got, black, I got black friends. You know, that's, that's essentially <laughs> what the film is saying. And, and again, amazing and beautiful, but yeah, if I would have done it, I said, well, let me, it should be the black people introducing you to my white friend over here. And, and let's see what he's all about. Um, with Needle in a Time Stack, everything you're saying, I mean, that's what attracted me to the story was just that Mr. Silverberg short story 
it didn't try to explain time travel and it didn't try to explain love. It just acknowledged that, you know, technology is in our life and we have to deal with technology and that relationships are, they're unexplainable. You can see a couple that are together and you're like, I don't understand these two, but they're together. Um, you can walk past 500 people and not look at one of them and you walk past one person and you're like, God, I wonder what my life would be like if I could be with that person. I, want, I wonder. And uh, the opportunity to tell something that was just small and beautiful and emotive. And the big turns were just questions of what if. Um, that's all that attracted me to, to, to this story. And as far as time period, I mean, it's essentially now. I mean, it, it's, okay. it's a, a genre within a genre that's called near fi. And so it basically, you know, rather than people, you know, in spaceships and things like that, it's just, you know, if you had um, gone on a long, long vacation on a desert island, you know, 10 years ago, and you arrive now and, you know, everything is social media and smartphones, you know, they're, they're not that old, you know, these phones have not been right. in our lives that long, but think of how they've changed everything. And, and even, you know, a year ago, we would not have thought that Zooming is the normal way to have meetings and interact. But now we've got our etiquette of Zoom down. We know how to do it, we know how to mute ourselves, unmute, all that kind of stuff. Um, so to me, it's just, it's now, but if, if time travel really did arrive tomorrow, how would that affect us? How would it change us? Not just, oh my God, I got to go back in time and kill the most horrible despot. You know, I got I to gotta go back and, 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 and save the most amazing person in history from a tragic end. Maybe there's that, but maybe it's just like, you know, self-driving cars. They're wonderful, but if you're not paying attention, something bad is going to happen. It's not necessarily nefarious, but we got to learn to live with that technology. And that to me is what attracted me to the story. It wasn't this, you know, awful, terrible, heavy sci-fi thriller. It was just, well, we got time travel now. Now we got to deal with, uh, I, I don't feel well. I got to call home. Did some little thing change in my life? Yeah, that's what we got to deal with. Um, but the big thing, what if I did go home and I thought I had two kids and now I have one? I thought I was married to this person, but now I'm not, you know, that's an extraordinary change. Um, and that's a change, you know, if I were faced with that, I can't really think about going back in time and changing history, but I can think about going home and all of a sudden my life is a little different. And that relates, you know, our, our youngest just started college and now I go home and life is different. And I got to think about, well, was I home enough? Did I, was I good enough dad? Was I, you know, will I see him tomorrow? Not even in a hyper negative way, but just, is he going to come home? Is he going to call? Is he going to text? It's all of those what ifs. And that's what attracted me to the story because they're just gentle and fundamental, but monumental at the same time. Well, John, I understand you have some, some other commitments that you have to, to attend to this afternoon, but I want to thank you for your time, man. We actually would love to have continued with you because it's a fascinating conversation. But John, thank you for uh, your time today. And thank you to everybody who uh, logged in to this roundtable discussion for Needle in the Time Sack, which drops in theaters October the 15th, Lionsgate Film. Go out and support director John Ridley. And let me thank just say real quick, thank you to all of you. I mean, first of all, um, again, I've, I've had a very nice career, but having people who support and, and even those of you as critics, it's not whether you like the film or not, the fact that you talk about it, the fact that um, we get to be part of a conversation is incredibly special. And the fact that this morning that it, it really, while maybe ostensibly it was about me talking about my film, to be able to talk with some people who, again, inspired me um, and the opportunity just to say to you all, thank you. I mean, sincerely, you, you, you don't know what it meant, um, whether it was inspiration, whether it was just an afternoon with my dad, you all contributed to my life to many lives out there. So maybe the morning started about me, but it's going to end with a thank you from me to you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you for what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. You guys take care. And uh, Sean, will this be available uh, that we can actually have it play back? Yeah, we want you to play it back on your platform. Black <laughs> Report, fantastic, for sure. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to double check and make sure before we signed off, but thank you. <laughs> no, thank you guys. And thank John. John, thank you very much again, sir. My it's pleasure. Been a great, great, great morning. Bless you all. Please take care. You guys take care. Oh, dear. All right.